Okay, in the second video, what we're going to do is we're actually going to take you through several different examples of information asymmetries that show up in the real world, just so you get a sense of how they're applied. Um, we just went through one of them, in fact, which was Akerlof's Lemons problem. It's perhaps one of the most classic information asymmetry thought experiment there was. In fact, Akerlof, uh, when he published the paper, not very many people thought it was a big deal. The paper has very sort of you know low-level math. It's just really algebra. I mean, you saw the math just previously there. It's it's very straightforward. But the paper over time became a seminal paper in economics, and ultimately, in fact, uh, earned Akerlof, or was at least largely the reason why Akerlof uh, won the Nobel Prize. And and also he did a lot of work in in risk otherwise, but. A lot of it really began um, with his lemons problem. So just an example of a very simple idea, but it becomes very powerful when you realize how applicable it is. Uh, and I think you'll get the, the sense of that. Um, you know, just some of the, the relative places it shows up, uh, you know, real estate and, and stock trading and, and so on and so forth. Uh, perhaps um, some of the most important places we see it show up is, in fact, um, for things like management, like how we choose to, to, to manage people and delegate tasks and whether we're able to sort of monitor their effort. Uh, we'll do an, a numerical example of this uh, here soon. Also, when I'm, if I'm an employer and I'm thinking about hiring someone, uh, there's a huge information asymmetry there. Uh, I may have a resume and I may be able to see that person's education, for example, but I don't really know with any relative certainty um, how that individual is going to perform uh, if I am actually to hire them. And if you've ever rented an apartment, you know that there's risk on both sides. Um, you, If you're the renter, um, you don't want to rent your apartment to someone who's going to trash it. You want to make sure that you rent your apartment to someone uh, who's going to take good care of it. Uh, this is why there's a fairly lengthy screening process for apartments. Also, if you're a rentee, you want to make sure that you get an apartment from a landlord that it's going to treat you well. It's going to fix your stuff. It's going to be attentive to your needs as a tenant, um, which doesn't always occur. Um, and then healthcare. Healthcare is, is a place where information asymmetries become a huge issue. Um, and we're talking about the concept of pre existing conditions. Pre existing conditions is the idea that if I go to attempt to buy health insurance, but I'm already sick, the insurance company sees me as a fairly large liability and therefore will be hesitant to take me on as a potential client. In fact, historically in the United States, where we have had a private healthcare market, uh, oftentimes it was impossible for people who already had sicknesses, uh, specifically things like cancer, it was virtually impossible for them to receive health insurance uh, in order to help them pay for their health care costs because the insurance companies knew that these individuals were going to have gigantic bills. And so that's why when you hear the concept of pre-existing conditions as being so important into the conversation of the health care market, that's why. It, it represents a fairly large information asymmetry. Um, this is why health insurance companies will often require a health checkup before they sell someone a plan. Um, this is sort of the, at least historically how things tended to work. What risk does, aside from reduces the relative utility of a particular event, it also tends to require compensation. So if I'm going to experience a disutility from taking on a risky choice, I expect it to be compensated for it. Now this creates the famous phrase, high risk, high reward. That is to say that if you want to receive high rewards, you likely have to incur high risk to do so. Well, that really just means that risky outcomes require high amounts of compensation for someone to undertake them. And so in a sense, the idea of high risk, high reward is pretty straightforward in the sense that higher risk will require higher compensation. For example, if someone works in an industry in which the mortality rate is higher, the, the chances of death are higher, uh, we expect, generally speaking, these individuals to be compensated at greater amounts than similarly talented individuals with similar levels of education, all the various things that cause someone's wage to be different with similar attributes, but isn't a comparatively risky job. They will require higher compensation in order to accept uh, the additional risk. This is why you see credit card companies require um, both credit screenings as well as then charging lower credit score individuals with higher interest rates to compensate them for the higher risk that the person may 
in fact, not pay their bills. Um, if you ever go take out a large loan from a bank, for example, for a house, they often require you to put up some collateral. Usually this is an asset, a, a motor vehicle, or at least a, a, an amount of money that even if you were not to say pay back the loan at all, then the bank is able to take your collateral. And so obviously the more collateral that banks require, um, the less risk they incur because the more likely it is that, that someone who has the collateral is, is going to pay back the loan. And so collateral becomes that, that comp compensatory thing that banks use to, to screen out bad uh, loanees. Uh, in our previous example of the Lemons uh, car, um, if we're going to buy a used car, we often want to test drive it at least. Um, I was always told growing up that if I before I bought a used car that I should go have a mechanic look at it. Now, what's interesting is that oftentimes, um, not just in the context of the used car market, but in many other context, contexts, there's actually markets that, that uh, pop up uh, that, that form around these particular issues. So in the context of used cars, we have Carfax reports uh, that literally detail the, the history of cars of the vehicles so that um, you know what you're purchasing before you purchase it. Um, this has greatly reduced the inefficiency of the used car market and why there are a lot more used cars on the road today than there used to be, uh, aside from the fact that cars are, are higher quality now. Also, Angie's List, which is a uh, an online service in which uh, you can check the ratings of carpenters and plumbers and uh, you know uh, people who work on h homes and contractors and things. And so it's just a way for people to verify. You think about it like Amazon reviews for products. You know, it's just if you're going to buy something or if you're going to contract out a service to an individual, you want to know something about that individual so it lowers the risk. You know, whether that's the risk that the job is bad or whether that's the risk that the job occurs at all, or even if we're just talking about buying a good, there's always some risk that you're not going to get the value out of the good that you think, right? There's this concept in, in economics called buyer's remorse, where you buy something and then you immediately realize it's not worth the amount of money that you paid for it. That's risk, right? And we want to avoid that risk as much as possible. And so when we, we are potentially taking on more risk, we will often require a fairly high payoff. I mean, you consider the lottery. The lottery is, is you know, if we think about risk as just the chances of, of winning the lottery, the lottery has immense risk, right? It's very, very low, 99.99% chance that you're not going to win a, a lottery. And so in order to take those odds, your payoff uh, has to be very, very large. And so, of course, multi-million dollar uh, and even billion dollar lottery uh, totals have, have even caused people that would never have bought a lottery ticket otherwise to purchase them because the payouts were so high that the compensation was uh, made it you know, willing to, to take on that particular risk. Risk can be individual, so we can think about risk as simply occurring to the individual, you know, decision, like in the context of the, the lemons problem, or in the context of a bank loaning out money to an individual borrower. Or risk can also become systemic, which is what we saw occur during the Great Recession. Um, so essentially what occurred during the Great Recession was you had uh, banks which were able to write uh, mortgages to home borrowers and then quickly sell those mortgages to another bank. Uh, the banks were buying mortgages and creating bonds with them and then they were using bonds as investment vehicles. And so as long as the mortgages were being paid then the investment vehicles were good and solid and everybody was making money. But as soon as the recession started to hit and mortgages stopped being paid, um, what ended up happening is that the value started to get reduced all the way down the line. And so even as default rates started to go up, banks were still able to sell mortgages to other banks because those other banks didn't realize that there was a lot of risk in the economic system. And so they continued to buy uh, mortgage-backed securities. And, and even though the, the risk was piling up and piling up, uh, not very many people knew about it or, or, or sort of saw it. Um, this is really uh, well um, uh, illustrated in two videos. Um, the one is the crisis of credit video. I really encourage you uh, to, to watch this video. I'll make sure that I post the lecture slides and so you can click this link. And then also this uh, pretty sort of uh, funny video uh, featuring Selena Gomez from the movie uh, The Big Short. Um, in fact, I encourage you to watch the movie The Big Short. It's a fantastic movie that does a great job in both explaining 
what caused the Great Recession and the financial meltdown, but also is a wonderful example of, of the risk, uh, not just individual, but the global risk uh, inherent in the financial services industry. We break down information asymmetries into two broad categories. Um, there are a lot of information asymmetries within these categories. Uh, the first one we refer to as adverse selection. We call this ex ante risk. This means that it, it's risk that is felt before a transaction occurs and will often cause the transaction to, in fact, not occur. And we saw that with Akerlof's lemmings. Akerlof's lemmings is an adverse selection problem. The other type is called moral hazard. Moral hazard is, is an ex post risk or an after transaction risk. This occurs when something about the relationship changes after a transaction occurs. An example of this is that once someone buys car insurance, their driving behavior may become riskier because now they have insurance and they know they won't be on the hook for all of the money. Of course, the fact that car insurance companies increase premiums uh, if you're in wrecks reduces this behavior. So as you can see, uh, car insurance companies are, are ready for that uh, potential um, outcome. Uh, but these show up in many markets, uh, but especially they show up in the healthcare and financial services industry um, for the reasons that we've already uh, covered. But for adverse selection, for example, um, oftentimes the individuals who uh, most need health insurance are the ones who are going to be least able to purchase it. So there's a massive adverse selection problem in healthcare. The people who most need it are, of course, sick. But sick people are the least likely to be able to maintain payment of their premiums because their premiums are just going to keep going up and up and up and up. So again, this is historically why in private healthcare systems, uh, low health uh, individuals, typically low income individuals, have uh, a very difficult time in uh, receiving health care. Uh, through health insurance. Uh, this is why the recent Affordable Care Act in the United States uh, sought to create uh, an expansion of Medicaid. Medicaid is a, is a system under which the government provides essentially health insurance to individuals who are then able to take that insurance and, and use it to, to receive care. Um, there's been a lot of benefit uh, to the Affordable Care Act is, since it's been implemented, um, saved lives and got people who weren't able to go uh, to the hospital able to go to the hospital. And, and really what it did was it took away the adverse selection problem in healthcare. Um, one of the main things that the Affordable Care Act did was it in fact required healthcare uh, insurance companies to ignore pre-existing conditions. And basically what the government said is, look, we'll cover uh, for the increase in your cost from these um, pre-existing condition individuals, and, and we're going to fund that through tax dollars. So in a sense, what the Affordable Care Act and really any kind of universal health care system um, is, not single payer, single payer is a little bit different from universal health care. Universal health care just means that the government sort of provides the insurance um, single payer is a situation where the government is actually providing the health service and there really is no um, health insurance uh, per se. Um, there's also moral hazard and health insurance um, issues, but really on the side of the doctors. Um, I may be concerned that because of the way in which the healthcare system is set up through the in insurance pay system, that my doctor may behave differently if I'm on Medicaid versus if I have private health insurance. So in fact, um, there's always been concern amongst low-income individuals with Medicaid that they're going to inherently receive worse care because the doctors are going to have a bias against them. That basically, that once the transaction has occurred, sort of once they start receiving care, that the doctor's behavior um, is going to change because the individual happens to be um, on Medicaid. And there's all sorts of interesting research um, about this as well. In financial services, adverse selection is, is pretty straightforward. It's why low credit score individuals uh, get higher interest rates. It's why credit screening exists in the first place. And there's also moral hazard. A classic example of moral hazard is uh, the CEO of a company um, issues a bunch of bonds in order to raise a bunch of money for the firm. But instead of using that money to increase the profits of the firm, which is the reason why you issue bonds, the CEO uses that money to lavish himself with gifts and, and, and things like this. This has happened a, nu a numerous amount of times, um, most famously with the CEO of the company Tyco, um, who basically looted his company 
company after issuing several large um, amounts of bonds. And, and really what you can think about that is, is a moral hazard problem. That once, because the money he was receiving wasn't his money, um, we, we might believe that he behaved differently because of that. Um, and there's pretty strong evidence that that was the case. Now, there's a special type of moral hazard that I want to end this lecture discussing and actually taking you through um, what at first seems like a, a complicated numerical example, but it's actually fairly straightforward. Um, the special type of moral hazard is called the principal agent problem. The principal agent problem exists anytime you have a situation in which there's some delegation of task from a, a principal, like say the owner of a company, uh, to an agent, uh, perhaps a manager of a company. So the owner of a company is delegating to the manager um, a certain amount of responsibility, and the manager is supposed to act uh, in the best interest of the principal, but oftentimes the, the principal is not able to monitor the behavior of the agent and so has to use a inefficient sort of system of looking at the the books of the company and seeing how their profits are doing to, to understand if, if the manager or the agent in the circumstance um, is doing well. And, and so this can be a bit of a moral hazard problem once delegation has occurred. Um, so the numerical example of moral hazard uh, begins with a scenario in which we have an individual, Annie, who owns a restaurant um, and employs uh, Friedman as her manager. Um, Friedman has two choices. He either can give high effort or he can give low effort. Um, high effort uh, costs him a little bit, uh, so if he does give high effort, it, it reduces his utility by two. Um, low effort reduces his utility by zero, so no cost from low effort. The probability of a profitable or unprofitable outcome, of course, depends on Friedman's effort. The higher the effort he gives, the higher the chances are that the restaurant will be profitable, and the lower the effort that Friedman gives, the lower the chances are that the uh, company, the restaurant in this, in this case, will be profitable. And again, we can see that his high effort um, increases the chance of being profitable, 80% um, uh, chance of being profitable with high effort, 20% uh, chance of not being profitable with high effort, uh, whereas if he gives low effort, there's only 40% chance of profitability uh, and a 60% chance, therefore, um, of, of no profitability. Notice that the, the chances of unprofitability are simply one minus the chances of profitability because there's two outcomes, and, and those two outcomes have to sum to one uh, in terms of probability. So just take a second here, uh, maybe pause the video to sort of just make sure that you're following along. Um, and if not, go back and, and check to make sure that everything makes sense before we move on. Because again, it, while the next material uh, looks complicated, it's pretty straightforward, but I just want to make sure that everyone is sort of ready uh, before we move on. All right, so when you're ready, let's get going. Now, what we're going to assume is that Annie cannot monitor Friedman's effort. So this is where the moral hazard problem occurs. And then lastly, what we're going to assume is that Friedman could earn 10 units of utility uh, from his next best option. That means that given all of his potential options, the best he could do um, would be to earn 10 units of utility. We'll see why that's important um, here in just a moment. Okay, so... The goal for Annie is to design a contract that incentivizes Friedman to give high effort. So she doesn't just want him to show up to work, but she also wants him to give high effort. This, of course, increases the chances that her restaurant is profitable. She needs his expected utility uh, from high effort to be greater than 10. 10, of course, being the utility he could receive um, if he were to do his next best option. So just to get him to show up to work, Annie needs uh, his expected utility from a high effort to be greater than 10. Secondly, she is going to pay Friedman differing wages with respect to whether the company is profitable or unprofitable. So WP if the company is profitable and WU if the company is unprofitable. So we can put these two things together and if he gives high effort, his expected utility looks like this. Simply the probability of high, uh, excuse me, the probability of profitability times the wage he's paid if the company is profitable, plus the probability of unprofitability 
times the wage he's paid if the company is unprofitable. And then, of course, minus two, where two is the effort cost. As you recall, we said that uh, if Friedman gives high effort, he reduces his utility by two. And again, we got these numbers simply by the fact that we said that the if he gives high effort, the, prob the prob probability of the company being profitable would be 80%, and the probability of the company being profitable, not profitable rather, would be 20%. So as you can see, the expected utility calculation here is very much like an expected value calculation. If he gives low effort, then his expected utility looks like this. Um, you see that the chances he gets the profitable wage uh, goes down, uh, the chances he gets the unprofitable wage goes up, but he doesn't incur the effort cost um, of two, and so that, therefore, there's his expected utility. And again, take a second, maybe pause the video, and just go through all these numbers and make sure you understand what we're doing. Again, uh, we just simply know that when he gives high effort, uh, the pr uh, probability of profitability is 80%. And so he gets the wage of profitability. Um, it is unprofitable with a ch uh, chance 20%, in which case he'll get the wage of the unprofitable wage. Um, and then if he gives low effort, we can just see that the chance of profitability falls to 40%, and the chance of unprofitability rises to 60%. So Annie needs to create a contract that satisfies two constraints. First is this first one here. She needs Freeman's expected utility from a high effort to be greater than 10. This gets him in the door. This gets him showing up to work. Remember, he could go do anything else and get a utility of 10. So whatever the contract is, Friedman getting high effort needs to incentivize him, what we call incentive compatibility. Additionally, because she doesn't wish him to just show up to work, she also wants him to provide high effort. We need that the expected utility from the high effort is greater than the expected utility from low effort. So she needs to satisfy these two constraints with a single contract. It seems like it might be complicated, but I think as you'll see, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so notice the first constraint gets him in the door, the second one gets him to give high effort. Okay, so this is just the first constraint. Um, this is just this constraint right here. All we've done is we've changed it. Instead of saying greater than 10, we're just uh, creating an equality out of it. This makes the math a lot easier um, and doesn't change anything, and I'll explain at the end why it doesn't. So if you notice, this is just the expected utility of high effort. Again, we, we saw this in the previous slide. This was the expected utility of high effort right here. Um, and we just need it to be equal to 10. And then the second constraint, uh, this constraint right here, um, looks like this. Um, and that is that we need uh, his high effort expected utility. Notice that's just here. We need it to be, uh, again, normally we would want to think about it as greater than his low effort expected utility, but we're just equalizing these so the math is a little bit easier. Um, and again, I'll explain um, what that means here in just a moment. All right, so again, this is the first constraint. We need his high effort expected utility to be just, uh, to be um, at least 10 units, and we need his high effort expected utility to be at least as big as his low effort uh, expected utility. So all we do is we have two equations and two unknowns. So we have this constraint, which is an equation, and this constraint, which is an equation, and then we have two unknowns, wu and wp. So we can just solve for either one. Here I've chosen to first solve for wu. Um, so if you solve for wu in the first constraint, um, you get this. So all I've done is taken this equation and I've solved for wu, um, and this is the outcome. Uh, I encourage you to pause the video at this point and work through the math. Uh, it's a very basic algebra. Everyone should be able to do it, but I think it would be helpful um, for you to do that. So again, uh, this uh, comes from solving this first constraint for wu, um, and then we're just going to do that for the second equation as well. So we just solve for wu um, from this equation. Now what we notice is that the uh, unprofitable wage that we want to set is a function of the profitable wage. Um, and let me explain what that means. All right, so this is just a restatement um, of these two uh, when we solve for the unprofitable wage. Um, now, since we have uh, both of these equations solved for the unprofitable wage, we know, therefore, that these two equations should equal each other 
Um, so all we have to do is set these two equations equal to each other, and then this actually allows us to solve for WP. So again, we have two equations and two unknowns. Now we're actually solving for the explicit value of one of those unknowns. So again, we just take these two equations, we set them equal to each other, and then this allows us to solve um, for WP. And when we solve for WP, we see that the efficient uh, profitable wage should be $13. So this means that when the restaurant is profitable, Annie should pay Friedman at least $13. Now, I say at least, again, because prior we had a greater than here. We took that away because, again, we wanted to make the math a little bit easier. So what we say is, is that the profitable wage needs to be at least $13. I hope that makes sense. We then take uh, the uh, WP equaling 13, and we can just we can plug it in to either uh, one of these. It gives us the same answer. Uh, and when we do that, we see that the efficient unprofitable wage is at most $8. And so, again, here, what we're set suggesting is that if the restaurant is profitable, uh, Annie should pay Friedman at least $13. And if the restaurant is unprofitable, she should pay him no more than 8 and so it sort of creates these upper and lower bounds of incentive compatibility. So again, because these uh, two wages, the profitable wage and the unprofitable wage, in fact satisfy both of these constraints, not only do these wages get Friedman to show up for work, but these wages, uh, a profitable wage of 13, uh, of at least 13, and an unprofitable wage of no more than eight, not only gets him to show up to work, um, but also gets him uh, to give high effort. We refer to this as incentive compatibility. And this is the way in which we deal with the moral hazard problem. We try to develop incentive compatible schemes that get our employees, in the case of managers, to behave the way we want them to, to even if we're not able to monitor. I, of course, do this with my students. I try to construct class room exercises as well as out of the classroom exercises that's going to get my students to want to learn the material even in times when I can't be there to make sure uh, that, that they're doing what I want them to do. So this is of course is why I try to create incentive compatible uh, interesting topic areas. But if you just think about this problem of incentive compatibility, I'm sure you can think of an innumerable number of examples both uh, things that you personally have experienced or things that may, you can just think of um, that uh, would, would cause these particular issues. So just to wrap up real quickly, um, you know, what we talked about in these two videos um, was the concept of information asymmetries. And then we further developed the concept of information asymmetries into the two broad categories of adverse selection and moral hazard. And the big story here is simply that information asymmetries cause markets to be inefficient. And because they cause markets to be inefficient, this means that the first fundamental welfare theorem doesn't hold. And that's why we refer to information asymmetries as market failures. They are market failures in the same sense of externalities are market failures because they cause private markets to be inefficient. So normally the markets would be efficient, but because we've relaxed our perfect information and homogenous goods assumption, uh, as we did previously, we saw that, for example, the used car market became inefficient. And so this, I think, does a good job of explaining the problem of information asymmetries and why, when there are information asymmetries, you often see compensatory schemes like higher interest rates or large security deposits uh, when renting an apartment.